would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The preamble to the state of Missouri Constitution, we the people of Missouri with profound reverence for the supreme ruler of the universe and grateful for his goodness to establish this constitution for the better government of the state. And now prayer. Lord, thank you for letting us come together, letting us be able to see each other. Thank you for letting us be able to consider your will for us. And let us see what the city of Branson can do to get back open again. We thank you for discernment and wisdom. But mostly, we thank you for your guidance. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for coming today. Obviously, it's a different meeting, uh, but we're able to actually sit in the same room and see each other, uh, and it's being live streamed uh, out to the public so that they can have the access to the information. It is my responsibility as mayor under state law to take care of the ordinances of our city and the state laws relating to our city that they are complied with. Under one of our ordinances, Branson Municipal Code 2-64, I am tasked with the responsibility of being the presiding officer of the board and am required to re preserve strict order and decorum at all meetings. Decorum is often defined by the def dictionary as propriety and good taste in conduct or appearance. And one of the many definitions of order is a state of peace, freedom from confused or unruly behavior, and respect for law and proper authority. In the past, we've had abstention votes that were cast, and we were elected to represent the citizens of Branson and to vote. We are obligated to vote unless a conflict of interest prevents us from doing so. The common law in the state of Missouri supports this. Although I cannot force any member to vote, no member can be required to cast a vote. I do have the ability to control the order and decorum of these meetings. As a result, I'm announcing under my authority to preserve any decorum at these meetings, order and decorum at these meetings, that any abstention by any member of the board during this meeting can be recast as a no vote. Please remember our public response time of five minutes. Speaker decorum. In order to give everyone a chance to speak tonight, I would like to ask that if you are speaking on an item, that you keep your comments succinct to the topic and as short as possible. You will be allowed to only speak once on an item, and please do not repeat what has already been said by another speaker. Once public discussion has ended on an item and the board starts their discussion, no additional comments will be taken from the audience. Please remember to speak into the mic State your name and address for the record. Thank you. Please adhere to our five-minute rule guideline. At this time, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please announce the agenda? McConnell. Here. Klontz. Here. Simmons. Here. Akers. Here. Skeins. Here. Milton. Here. Castellan. Here. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you. First reading, please. Your Honor, this is the first reading, reading of Bill Number 5808A, an ordinance amending Chapter 58 of the Branson Municipal Code pertaining to personal conduct in closed public spaces and the spread of communicable diseases. Begin with a staff report from Chris Lebeck. Thank you, Mayor, members of the board. I apologize for sitting up here. Normally, I'd like to stand down there. However, there's going to be a number of exhibits, and I expect a number of um, hearted discussions today. Um, today, this board is faced with the decision that will affect every single visitor, citizen, and employee that works, plays, and entertains here in the city of Branson. And that decision is going to affect us for the very least the next 26 days. However, good things come to those that wait. 
Branson is likely going to benefit by meeting today instead of rushing to a decision last week like other area municipalities did when the governor moved up the timetable on reopening. As information coming out of both the governor's office and the Division of Health and Senior Services has been both incredibly fluid and inconsistent. And thanks to the work of Commissioner Nichols and the Theater Action Group, as well as Alderman Skeynes, DHSS has finally provided some guidance as to how live entertainment venues in this state are to be treated under their new rules. DHSS did a 180 degree turnaround on Saturday, May 2nd, when they provided new information on this rule. Had we acted last week legally, I would have had no choice but to recommend to this board that you would be required to impose an occupant load uh, restriction on entertainment venues here in the city. Now that is not necessary unless this board feels it is appropriate to protect the citizens and visitors of the city. With that being said, the agenda for today is one part study session and one part decision making for this board. In order for this board to make the best possible decision for Branson, I want to spend some time going through the current DHSS order and what it mandates and also what the board can and cannot legally do before we discuss and decide upon a course of action. This is necessary because unfortunately there has been a significant amount of blatantly wrong and inaccurate information being pushed on social media channels by individuals in this community and elsewhere that is contrary to the authority this board has as an organization and what the DHSS order truly means. So what I want to start with first is I want to go through what this board can do. What's your jurisdiction? <coughs> what is your authority? So there's state law, section 79380. I'm going to go ahead and pull it up here so we can all look at the same thing. Designates what the board can do in this instance to control communicable diseases. 79380 says the Board of Aldermen may make regulations and pass ordinances for the prevention of the introduction of contagious diseases in the city and for the abatement of the same and may make quarantine laws and enforce the same within five miles of the city. So the bottom line is state law, and you'll notice when this was first passed, 1909, then 1919, 1939, this has been the law in the state as it applies to fourth class municipalities for quite some time. But bottom line is this gives this board extremely broad authority in what they can do. For example, and I'm not saying this to suggest that this board is going to take this path, but we could do what Gallup, New Mexico is doing right now. We could put up roadblocks at all the entrances and forbid people from coming into the city if we want to. Okay? We can take temperatures of people as they come off of 65, as they enter 76. This statute gives this board the authority to go to such extreme measures. And these are measures that may not sit well with the constitutionalists in the room and the freemen, but under our constitution, under state law, they are permissible. So the board has a wide gamut as to what they can and can't decide to do today. Okay? So that's your framework. That's what you work under. Now, what is the current law today in the state of Missouri? All right, on April 27th, and I'm going to walk through this here, uh, Director Randall Williams with the Department of Health and Senior Services passed a quarantine order. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open this up. This is getting opened directly from his website. Make this a little bigger, maybe, so we all can see it. Okay. So what this is, is we've seen this once before. The state comes down with mandates and says this is what the rules, what it's going to look like here in the state of Missouri. This was, came down on April 27, 2020. The authority that gives him to do this is 192.020, and it set out a number of very generalized rules. The first thing, right out of the gate, is... The new order out of DHSS took away the restriction on gatherings of 10 or more people. That is no longer a mandate in the state of Missouri. So if this board decides to lift that, they can. 
The second thing to note, this is paragraph one. It says, when individuals leave their homes or places of residence to work, to access food, or to engage in other activities, they, and this is a key word here, they should at all times practice social distancing. You'll notice it doesn't say they shall practice social distancing. So we look at that in paragraph one, but then we go down to paragraph two, and the order contradicts itself. And it says, every person and business in the state of Missouri no longer should, but now shall abide by social distancing requirements, including maintaining six feet of space between individuals. So again, I'm not here to give public legal advice. I can't. I give legal advice to the board. But this order is causing some confusion. Is it a should? Is it a shall? All right, so this is what we're dealing with. And then it goes one step further and it says individuals performing job duties that contact with other people closer than six feet, not shall, but should take enhanced precautionary measures to mitigate the risks of contracting or spreading COVID-19. And then it goes on to say it shall apply in all situations. So you should, but then it shall apply. All right, so that's how social distancing is laid out in this order. Again, this order was effective at 12.01 last night. Then we go to paragraph three. Paragraph three lays out what we already have in force here in the city of Branson, where we're protecting our elderly. Okay, nursing homes, long care facilities shall not visit unless it's basically for critical care or other needs. Now we move into paragraph four, and this is a pretty big issue. Okay, this is what's caused us some confusion as a municipality. I mentioned Commissioner Nichols earlier. We got, he got different guidance through Billboard Magazine than this city got directly from DHSS and the governor. But what this says, it says any entity that employs individuals that engage in retail sales to the public. What's a retail sale? It's not defined anywhere in here. Arguably a retail sale is any good or service being sold. Theater, movies, restaurants, you name it. Is it a retail sale? And what it says, it shall limit, again, it's not a should, but shall limit the number of individuals in any particular retail location as follows. The order says 25% of the authorized fire building code, if it's under 10,000 square feet, and 10% or less if it's 10,000 square feet or more. This is the order. This is the mandate that has come down from the Department of Health and Senior Services, DHSS. Goes on further, and this is really not applicable to the city of Branson because we are not responsible for the schools. <coughs> this is for the schools more than anything that they're to remain closed. However, they can open up to retrieve, retrieve personal belongings and whatnot. And finally, we go to restaurants. Well, starting today under state law, restaurants can be open, okay? But they have to take certain precautions, including six feet between tables, lack of communal seating areas to parties that are not connected, and not having more than 10 people at a single table. So these are requirements that they shall adhere to. Again, you notice there's nothing in here about occupant load. So the question is, is a restaurant fall under a retail sale? Good question, don't know. State office buildings are open, shall be open to the public as soon as practical. And then for those of you that carry firearms, good news, you can still sell and transfer them. All right, so that's the order that has come down. Now, underneath this order, let's talk about what it else also says. How is it enforced? It's enforced by all local and state health authorities. However, and again, this is, goes back to what this board's authority is, nothing shall limit the right of local authorities to make such further ordinances, rules, regulations, and orders not inconsistent with this order, which may be necessary for the particular locality. So we may need special rules here for the city of Branson, all right? This order encourages that behavior. It also says that local public health authorities are hereby directed to carry out and enforce the provisions of this order by any legal means. So what does that mean? OK, 
Okay, this is one thing that we've kind of played hide the ball with at the state level. And if we go up here and we look at the state law, I'm gonna pull this statute up you so you understand that this is not the city of Branson calling this, this is state law. Any legal means includes this section. If I look at 192.320, if I can make the computer box work. Violation of the law. So that order that came down from DHSS came down under section 192.020. Okay, and if you get my mouse over there, right there. What does this say? It says, shall be deemed guilty of a class A misdemeanor. So a person that violates this order that came down from DHSS has the potential to be cited for a class A misdemeanor. That is up to a year in the county jail or up to a $2,000 fine. That is state law. That is not city law, that is state law. So that is the framework that we are dealing with. With this, there are a number of unanswered questions. Dr. Williams, who is the director of DHSS, is an appointee of the governor, okay? In this case, he was appointed by former Governor Greitens. He is a part of the executive branch and has the head of the executive branch, Governor Parsons, has released a lot of information through press releases and his website. And that information is constantly evolving with regards to what the public and the city citizens of Missouri can and can't do under this order. So this is where we are today. This is the framework we as a city have to make a decision under. This order is in effect. The board has the ability to make quarantine laws. So we have to decide how to move forward. So to kind of level set this for everybody, and to make this kind of simple, the board really has a simple choice. And I'm gonna pull this up here. I've typed this out so we can all look at it together. There's basically three choices before the board today. All right, this bill that's been proposed, you can vote it down outright and continue with the ordinance as it currently exists. That ordinance will be in effect until June 15th when the governor's state of emergency expires. So we can leave it as is right now. That's option one. Option two is we, this board, through an amendment, through an motion, could repeal the current ordinance outright and just we just rely and depends solely on the order that's come out of DHSS and the FAQ by the governor. That's your second option. And then your third option, again, this is what's been encouraged by that order, is we can come up with additional rules that might benefit our unique situation in Branson by considering those in the current bill and other possible amendments. Again, remember, the order encourages that behavior because every community is different. I've heard this statement said quite a bit. Our federal government has made comments to the effect of it's a locally executed, state managed, and federally supported situation we're dealing with. That's the framework we are being asked to operate under today. So, where does that leave us? So in light of the due diligence, I prepared a bill for you today. Okay, what you have are the ideas that correct some of the inconsistencies in the messaging by our state government. One example is social distancing. They take into account what our very own DHSS and CDC are recommending, face coverings, not face masks and disinfection, and continue some of the themes that have worked in Branson to this point, occupant load, as well as adding some new ones to educate our visitors when they come to visit our city, what the rules are. Again, locally managed, signage. Our goal today is to culminate what you decide with what the state mandates, to run the two things in parallel. And I'll just point out, a member of our community recently pointed out on social media when he said something to the effect of, it doesn't make sense to bring a blank piece of paper before the board and have them fill out. We would be here all night. So we had to prepare something so for this board to consider. Okay. As you all know, I try to discourage amendments on the fly. I think it's bad practice. So instead of adding amendments on the fly, you have a document 
that can have pieces removed as you see fit or added in the event anybody likes the Gallup New Mexico alternative of setting up roadblocks. But the bottom line is we have a starting point today to work from, and that starting point is based on science and based on the recommendations we are getting from the CDC and DHS. Yes. So from that point forward, I'm going to stop there because I, what I want to do next, open it up to the board for some questions, some comments, is I want to pivot into the actual bill, and we're going to go through it line by line, and we can discuss it. So I'll stop there. Questions at this point? Are there any? Yes, Kevin. Chris, quick question. I um, appreciate you walking through that with regard to the, um, potentially the ordinance and the bill component. How does that compare if you, if as a board, we killed the current ordinance and it became a resolution, what then? How does that, because all that you were talking about was the, a re, an ordinance or um, not a resolution, correct? Yeah, what you have before you today is a bill. Okay, a bill which will become, an, if the board approves it, an ordinance. Correct, but I guess my question is, you have laid out three options. I guess the fourth option, and it's just a question, is what happens if the board says, okay, there are this, wanna, bill, this you, bill is rife with things that maybe our community and, and, mm -hmm. and that don't make sense potentially, and if that were the case, uh, considering, um, uh, considering resolution, how does that, is that exactly the same as what you laid out with an ordinance, or would that be different? That would be different, and what I would tell this board is this. I think the last thing, and this is me speaking personally, the last thing the community needs is another, th another set of shoulds. We should leave those to the health department. The health department should make recommendations. That order alludes to that. You know, the state should make recommendations. All that this board, in my opinion, should be looking at, are there any requirements over and above what the state has brought down that we think we should impose on the citizens of Branson? and then leave the recommendations, read the guidance to the health department. They're doing, Ms. Marshall and her team are doing a very nice job putting that information out at a county-wide level. Okay, we did a resolution last time, as you recall, Alderman McConnell, I kind of got lost in the noise. And I, and I fear if we do that today, we're gonna do the same situation. It's gonna okay. be the same situation thank, again. Thank you for that. So the answer though is yes, we could do a resolution. Yes. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments before I move forward? Mr. Please? Milton. Well, well, I'm not sure where to start with all that. Um, I appreciate the education on the difference between should and shalls. When I read the governor's ordinance and he said that retail would be subject to those square footage guidelines, I read it as a layman to say retail is limited to those guidelines. I didn't read it to say retail is a restaurant or retail is a theater or retail is a mini golf. I just read it as it's written where it said retail businesses, but I'm not an attorney. Um, is Lisa gonna be joining us today from Taney County? She is in. Okay. Uh, Lisa, the other Lisa just pointed out something. We need a motion on the floor before we okay. go into the bill. Thank you. FYI. Right. You've heard the first, for, no, we haven't heard the first reading of the bill yes. yet. Yes, I read it. I have read it. Okay, that's, okay, I'm with you. Do I have a motion approving this bill? So move. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Thank you. At this point in time, <coughs> anyone in the audience wishing to speak regarding this matter? Instructions earlier were in regard to if you've got something you want to speak to, come up the microphone, please, and introduce yourself. Mayor, try to social distance. Yes. Mayor, I know you controlled decorum, but what would be helpful before we start having public comment, uh, unless Lisa thinks it's out of line, it'd be probably helpful to walk through this bill and the specifics of it, and then maybe open it up to public comment. That way, we're all rowing in the same way. We're all on the same team exploring this option. Okay, just following the agenda. No, yeah. Thank you. If, ma'am, is that all right with you that we uh, delay? No. Ma'am? I can't, I can't hear you, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
So again, I'm still on the staff report component. I just want to, as a okay. part of the staff report and the explanation to the board, let's walk through the ordinance and then go through. Excuse that me, before point. you start to speak, did you understand the recommendation from Mr. Lebec that he'd like everyone to hear before we start taking public statement? I believe before, excuse me, this is very strong, Mike. Before any decision is made in Ma'am, your, your name, please, and oh, yeah. you? Amber Thompson, I'm born and raised in Branson, Missouri. Went to high school here, so everybody pretty much knows me. Uh, I'm no foreigner to the crowd. Uh, if you've lived here for any time period. I believe, um, I'm representing the Civil Defense Coalition and also privately myself as a citizen of the state of Missouri and, and a citizen of the United States. I believe anything that passes in Congress, state or federally or even on a city level, county level, should be presented to the people and be allowed to be discussed and debated before anything is passed. That's, That's what just we're doing, ma'am, right now. Yeah, okay. That's what we're doing right now, ma'am. Yeah. So can I speak? Is that okay? Well, if you, do you want to wait to hear what's been said or you have something else that you'd like to bring? Well, if you're going to pass a, f a fine on individuals in the city and say they have to wear a mask or gloves or PPE around town <laughs> before that, it's discussed, I'd like to discuss that first. Thank okay, you. That's a part of the bill that we'll go through. There'll be discussion on each individual area. So if you can hold that till then, till we get through it, I'd appreciate it. Sorry. Are you making a decision at this time as yes. to whether people should wear, then no. I should be allowed to speak first? Or no. it's a violation no. of our civil rights? Well, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Ma'am, you'll get your time to speak. We need to go through this first so we all know what it's about. We have nobody's voting on anything yet. Once we get through the chance and I can present this to you all, I assume, and I'm not going to speak for our mayor, he's going to open it up to public comment and allow you all to voice your concerns as to what's been presented. And that's what will happen. Thank you. We, we will get there. And I'll abide by the fact that normally we only allow someone to come to the podium once. That's not the case. You'll be able to come back to the podium. Can I invite Thank you. the audience? Thank you. I'm sorry. I remain in the, build, in the room. Okay. Okay, because I said it was capacity. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So let me continue. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, let's go through it. All right, Mayor. Continue my staff report. I want to work through this ordinance and what's presented to the board today. All right, if you recall, on May 23rd, this board acted, or excuse me, March 23rd, this board acted very quickly and passed some rules regarding to essential, non-essential businesses and kind of what, what Branson was going to look like and be challenged by for the next month and a half. So what we have to do, like I said before, we have to make a decision today whether we're going to continue under that, whether we are going to repeal it outright together or do something that is unique and tailored to the city of Branson. So what we have here is we have a modification to Chapter 58, which is our communicable disease ordinance and chapter that the board passed back on March 23rd. First thing you will note is consistent with the DHSS order. I have dropped the idea of public or social gathering, 10 or more. The board could still keep that in if they want to, but if, if by dropping it, it puts this in line with what the state's telling us. You also notice- Mr. Levesque, excuse me, just yes, a moment. Sir. Is your intent then, as we go through this, if the board wants to stop and deal with a particular item at that time? It would be helpful if I could just go through it high okay. level with everybody and then we can go back and visit. I right. know there's some hot topic Make areas. Notes, huh? right. Visit those specifically. So we're in our definitional section. Second thing, we cleaned up what an enclosed public space means. Third thing, we've dropped essential businesses because the idea here is we're going to treat all businesses the same. And then the fourth, and this came out of our, our um, emergency operations, we articulated specifically what occupant load means. And you'll notice in the definition it includes employees. Again, if you remember the DHSS order says individuals. It does not accept out employees. However, the governor's FAQ does. Okay, so the, their advisory information, not the actual literal rules of the order, accept out employees. So those are the definitions. That's how the definitions are going to look. Now, Purpose, it's always good to have a purpose. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to make sure people are safe. And this is where the changes start, okay? These are just proposed changes, okay? This is what we put before the board to consider. Number one, okay, 
the idea not of face mask. I keep hearing the term face mask, face mask, face mask. Fabric covering, okay? This is consistent with the exhibit provided from the CDC that they are recommending fabric coverings, okay? Accepted seating, eating, drinking, or smoking, or performing an entertainment. Or if the person has a medical condition, obviously, that would prohibit them. So again, this is the first piece. That's the first imposition on an individual in the city. Second thing, we've dropped out occupant load there, and we have maintained the six feet distance, okay? State mandate says still have to maintain social distancing. It's a little unclear whether it's a should or a shall. We've had it always as a shall in the city, so we continue that, but we also put in the exception if that person has job duties, okay, that require them to be in contact. So again, these are the personal conduct pieces. We move down further, now we're talking about what about businesses? How are businesses going to be treated under this new ordinance? Before, we had essentials were treated one way, non-essentials were treated another. Instead, everybody's subject to a 25% occupant load if they're under 10,000 and subject to an occupant load of 10,000 square feet or more <coughs> of 10%. Again, there's probably going to be some conversation here because like I alluded to earlier, we got some new information as of Saturday from DHSS that this may not apply to the theater. So we need, probably need to talk about this, all right? The disinfection component, all right? Asking our businesses that want to be open and want to make that choice to make sure that their high touch surfaces are disinfected, okay? Using recommended disinfection techniques provided by the CDC. And then so that we can account for that to make sure that it is in fact happening a public log. Okay, so again, what do we have? We have social distancing, face coverings, occupant load, disinfection. We've dropped the eating or drinking on premises prohibited. Okay, take that out because DHSS said Fair game, you can eat in the restaurant now. Added a new requirement, okay? And I know there may be some conversation here as to how this should look and how it should be read, but the bottom line is businesses that want to be open, consider requiring them to put signage out that says, hey, if you feel sick, stay home, don't congregate, practice good social distancing, at least putting citizens and visitors on notice that when you come, Follow these rules to help us out so we can stay open. Now, one of the challenges, and I've had a couple of phone calls from local businesses, is I don't have a printer. This is going to be hard for me to do. Talking with Chief Martin, we added the idea that, you know what, what if the city were to provide an ability to print off a city sign, okay, or provide a sign. Here, if you come pick this sign up and post it, you're good to go. You've done what you're supposed to, all right? So signage, and then the final component of this is the visitation, long-term care facilities, or retirement homes prohibited. Again, this is consistent. It culminates with state law, that DHSS order. Now the idea, if any or some or all of this, you wanna make some of these things go through, we need to figure out when it's all said and done when we want this to go into effect. You can have this go into effect as, immediately, as soon as immediately after this meeting. You can delay it. Again, that's the board's prerogative when we want this to go into effect, if we want any of it to go into effect. So again, our decision tree today, what's before the board in this bill, is face coverings, social distancing, occupant load, requiring businesses to disinfect that are open to the public, prohibitions on nursing homes and long-term care facilities, signage requirements, and then finally, when should we put this into effect? So that's the bill, that's my staff report. I'll stop there and we'll see where we go from here, all right? Are we ready then for open public yes. comment? Yes. <coughs> Are the aldermen, do you have any comments? You ready for open public comment? I think, Mayor, will we have comments after the public comment? Will we, then we'll, yeah, we, okay, yeah. fine, perfect, thank you.
All right, now the uh, podium is open for anyone who wishes to make the comment on the information that's been presented. Sorry, Lisa, I gave her some handouts or 12 each could you to pass out. Could you please identify, identify it? And, and, and my name is Amber Elizabeth Thompson. I represent the Civil Defense Coalition. I'm president and founder since 2017. Registered here in the state of Missouri with the Secretary of State's office. I was born and raised here. I did run for office against the local HR representative, Jeff Justice, brother of James Justice, a judge here in town. He was retired. Just so you know, FYI, the judge took away my children, but just so you know a little bit who I am since she asked me to introduce myself, against my belief should be federal law, okay? Because genocide, just to educate those in the audience, is not just killing of a citizen by the government. Another definition is taking a child away from one family and giving that child to another family. It's considered the lowest level of moral abuse against its own citizens of the government. Okay, so this has been going on for decades, all right? And nonprofits that are child representation, nonprofit advocates do not defend these children. Uh, we also have a very serious issue with uh, state representatives not wanting to defend us in this issue, okay? Because I, I personally know multiple organizations who've tried to end genocide in the United States. Now, regarding COVID outbreak, there are also multiple civil coalitions showing up across the United States on social media, et cetera. And they're passing information here and there that represents a threat. And these are, these are not social commentary only, solitarily. This is commentary that shows videos of TEDx talks that are highly regarded by the media. This is media clips being shown. And these are the five entities that currently are heavily in influencing us as citizens, even on a small level. So, and the reason I'm mentioning politicians is because at the back of the pa a pamphlet I gave to the alderman and the, ma the mayor of Branson is a letter that I got back from Senator Claire McCaskill when I asked her to end genocide in Missouri. Because at this point, uh, Title IV-E and, and D of your Social Security is getting drained by social services mandating they have a need and creating trivial reasons to steal children, excuses such as housekeeping. Uh, again, they said that I wasn't breastfeeding my baby or holding the baby bottle properly, and they create a joke, okay? So this has become an ongoing snowballing joke against you and I as citizens, all right, here in the state of Missouri. Claire McCaskill got voted out. We still have, again, opposition to us as citizens, even as a mayor, to speak to the governor or to the attorney general because there's no email contact available to the public. When you call them, they give you a dead end, okay? You may get, luckily get a phone call back, even if you're a large representative group, because I'm also a member of Reopen Missouri, which has now up to 17,000 people, okay, trying to protect our rights and people trying to protect our right to keep this country, the United States of America, okay? Now let's go to the other letter I have that I pass it to the alderman. And it's a letter from the Congress of the United States House of Representatives that I also ran against back in 2016, Billy Long. He's also been a dead end to your and my, and even possibly the mayor and the alderman's decision to try to speak with him. He asks and requests heavily in marketing on the media and to the news that you have to pay up to $1,200 plus a flight ticket and hotel just to speak with him. This is supposed to be a public servant position. And again, I'm speaking today because our citizens, even including the mayor himself and his family, are being cut off of a proper communication with individuals who can protect us. Governors are in direct communication and can be with the President of the United States. So we're asking today, from the, as a civil defense coalition, if you'll look at this piece of paper here, because we've already spoken, Reopen Missouri candidates have gone to the Capitol. Okay, we're requesting that the mayor have a meeting with the governor and press for it heavily, and that the citizens of this town and county will help press for that as well in regards to the situation, because we believe, believe that there, will, there is a constant pressing of the media incessantly of pressing for tracking, 
citizens as patients. And as a, again, in representation of our people, it's a constitutional violation for any medical procedure to be enforced and forced upon any citizen, for them to have to uh, behave, if anything, especially the demarcation of their flesh. Amber, and, you are less than 30 seconds. Yes, well, this is very important. So I do hope you do also have a chance for the people who are running for office to be allowed to speak and be debated if we can, I'll actually record it and send it to the media in this location, because the people are not even aware who they're electing. This letter says, Amber, medical, just one second, I'd like to at least barely. No, you're finished, Amber, I'm sorry. I also gave the mayor a letter that says involuntary, hold on, just, you're, you're, not even 15 finished. minutes. I'm sorry. You've spoken for five, five hours. Is up. This is involuntary demarcation of the flesh. An RFID law has been tried, just one second, I have. Nope, you're finished. Well. Okay, just so you know, I'm leaving and I should not be arrested because I'm trying, we have a law to present to the representatives to end uh, microchipping your flesh. Thank you. Amber, I'm, I'm sorry that the focus on this meeting today is in regard to our ordinance. And I would hope that any discussion today would be in regard to that ordinance uh, and the issues for a public meeting. We have a meeting on the 12th and at that time there would be available public input. This is a special meeting on the ordinance. Yes, I'm uh, Camille lombardi Olive. I am a candidate for Congress in the 7th District, and honorable board and public. Um, my concern, and the reason I'm here, and I look like I'm in this clown getup, is because I've worked... You need to get closer to the microphone, oh, man. It's because I've worked 10 disasters. Hurricane Katrina, Joplin tornado, Hurricane Hugo, I do have some familiarity with the idea of cross-contamination, especially in a field where you don't know what is there, what can potentially contaminate the public or yourself, or how you can spread it. My concern is with the masks. Now, I'm assuming the ordinance for the mask is to prevent me from giving it to you, which, by the way, I'm negative. I had the test last week. But I'm assuming that is the reason you have the mask ordinance. It's so that we don't spread it, because I could tell you these cloth masks and medical studies have come out and said they will not stop the virus from getting to you, especially if you don't wear goggles either. But um, so my concern is you have this ordinance. You're going to tell the citizens, OK, you have to wear a mask now. Who's going to contaminate these masks every night? Because when you go out in public and you're wearing this mask and somebody's coughing or sneezing, if they have COVID-19, the potential for cross-contamination is high and likely. So, once again, you're going to have an ordinance. I understand you, you, it's for the public concern and safety, but if they're not con uh, decontaminating their masks every night, then you are creating a potential for cross-contamination. They touch the mask, they go into a store, they touch something. They touch a keypad, somebody comes behind them, they touch it, they touch their nose. That's cross-contamination. Do you know you can carry contaminants on the bottom of your feet? When I work a disaster field, we don't wear our shoes from the field into the building. We take them out, off outside. The reason is you don't know what's on the bottom of your shoe. So there again, my concern is what is your main, you know, what is your main um, reason for enforcing this? If it's to protect other people, not so good. Unless you're going to inform the public that they need to take it home every night and wash it and, you know, put it in the dryer or steam it or something to decontaminate it. Um, because if they don't do that, and I know a lot of people that don't, and they wear it for weeks on end, you don't know what's on that mask. You don't know what they're touching with their hands. Oh, they could put gloves on. No. Gloves are also another Petri dish of cross-contamination. You sneeze, you touch something, it's on your glove now. You go and you get gas, it's on the gas pump. So, you know, we can decontaminate everything and still we can get sick. So my concern is, what is this denying us? What is the mask ordinance denying the average citizen? Because you're not keeping us safe 
by enforcing it. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Dr. Klontz. Sure. So, from my perspective, the you know I think that's a great lesson to say that the mask in and of itself is not the end all in terms of preventing infection from COVID-19. It does, however, afford protection from me should I sneeze or cough for these individuals in this front row from being covered with my respiratory droplets and thus me being that vector for infection to a wide number of people. Now, yes, in fact, you know, if you don't use a new mask or don't sterilize your current cloth or fabric mask, it is potentially a vector for contamination for other surfaces. But if you look at the recommendations for, for prevention, it's also, it also entails, you know, cleaning surfaces with disinfectant, just as this ordinance entails, or using hand sanitizer. So um, I, I applaud you in, in doing your research. It, it certainly does speak that there are multiple modalities that are required to prevention of this disease process, not just the mass for spread, you know, for prevention of spread from respiratory droplets. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, Hi. Ed, yeah, yeah. just for clarity, in this meeting, are we then addressing the speakers after they talk or do we wait for them all to? Well, I think Dr. Klontz did that for clarification on, on the mask with a lady who obviously knows what she's talking about. And uh, I, I think we play it by ear, Larry. We just try to see how it works. Okay. And uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Kelly Slabaugh. Um, I have, I grew up here, moved away, came back because it's such a great place. Um, and uh, I wanted to come and first thank you gentlemen. I emailed all of you and several of you responded. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, as well. Um, I appreciate the work you do. I do not envy your job. And I appreciate that you guys are desiring to represent our city and, and keep our city in good standing. Um, I, I'm not sure. Can I ask a question as well um, during this time? We may not know the answer, but you can ask it. <laughs> well, just one thing I noticed in this is nowhere in there is our churches mentioned. And I know there are many churches that have made the decision out of love for their congregations to go ahead and close down for the time being, but there are there is also a lot of unsurety and pastors desire to be law abiding and they don't know what to do <laughs> because there is no clear language saying that churches are protected. Um, if churches are added to the language of this, and perhaps I just missed it, honestly, I could read that far, but um, I would remind everyone that restricting assembly to worship is against the first, the first Amendment to the Constitution, and that should be taken seriously, as I know all of you guys do. Um, but really what I wanted to address is, I look around here and I see a lot of choices that have been made today. Most of you gentlemen, myself, most of the folks in here have made the choice to not wear a face mask. That's fine, there are others who have chosen to wear a face mask. Personally, out of respect for others in many places where I know I'm going to be close proximity to others, I do choose to wear a face mask out of respect for them. But choice is what's so valuable, and it's the one thing that sets our nation apart. By putting this ordinance into effect, you are removing the ability for citizens to choose for something that honestly is not really proven either way by re reproducible data. We have a lot of, you know, first level data coming in that says, well, it may, it may not. We have a lot of opinions, but we're not seeing a lot of reproducible data that shows that this is indeed actually even effective to the desired end. So I would just re remind you gentlemen that part of your job is to protect our God-given rights to choose and our constitutionally protected rights to choose for ourselves 
for our families what is best. I know most of the people here in Branson, if given the right to choose, will choose to put their neighbors first. They will choose to do the right thing. But I also know I grew up here. There's a strong, strong vein of patriotism <laughs> that sometimes can get a little carried away. But if pressured, if put under an ordinance of we will punish this by arresting or by fining, you're going to see a lot of resistance. And I would hate to see that because that's not what Branson's about. So I wanted to thank you, gentlemen, for the job you do. And I wanted to encourage you to, whatever you do, make sure that you are keeping the rights of your citizens in mind when you do these things. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Can I point out with regards to the idea of worship? What? Who, who, who's Real talking? Quick. Right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, Kelly brought up a really good observation oh. about worship, places of worship, and I just nuked what I had up there. I just wanted to pull up the state order that came out of DHSS. You will notice that a line of this is highlighted. It says that individuals may go to and from an individual's place of worship, provided that limitations on social distancing are properly adhered to. The, or, the bill that's before the board today doesn't touch places of worship because it's already been touched by this rule that's put out by DHSS. So again, state's already made a rule. I just want to point that out for clarification. For those of you in the Valerie that have concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. My name is Pearl Haining. Um, I live in Branson, Missouri, and I'm not a health care provider or a lawyer. Um, however, as someone with an easily compromised immune system, my responsibility to be informed and vigilant in the protection of my health and consideration for the health of others is something that I take very seriously. And I'm also very familiar with our Constitution um, because it's that document that attributes God-given value to every individual, including handicapped individuals like myself, which is not the case in many other places. I'm very aware of that and grateful for it. A lot of the decisions that have been made in recent months were motivated by fear due to a lack of data. As more data becomes available, the less cause we have for fear. So I'd like to share two important statistics before I begin. One, the initial reason that any restrictive measures were enacted was to lessen the potential burden on our hospitals. That effort was so successful that tens of thousands of employees at hospitals and clinics across the country have now been furloughed or had their hours cut, including in the Branson community due to a drastic reduction in patient volume. Two, officials were extremely cautious because health authorities didn't know the exact danger this virus posed. But as of May 1st, the CDC has now said that the hospitalization rate of COVID-19 is consistent with recent heavy flu seasons. Yes, we should continue to vigilantly care for our health, but our actions do not need to be guided by fear any longer. So with those two things in mind, I'd like to quickly mention my immediate concerns for the Branson community going forward. One, although well-intentioned, Mandating face coverings for asymptomatic individuals is ill-advised. Regardless of the CDC's recent condoning of that concept, there is significant data showing negative effects associated with incorrect and or prolonged usage of face coverings. And if an individual cannot wear a mask for legitimate reasons, to force them to publicly disclose those reasons at any retail establishment is a violation of both HIPAA and the ADA. 
On a more practical level, several individuals have asked me to communicate how much they love Branson, but how adamantly they would refuse to visit under these conditions. Furthermore, mandatory signage is not necessary, as most individuals are acutely aware of their health right now. So the vast majority of people who choose to visit Branson will be unusually healthy and cautious but eager to experience some degree of normality. Whether or not to wear a mask should be an individual decision. Two, while social distancing may offer good guidelines for this situation, it cannot legally or practically be mandated. If healthy individuals want to have a conversation, they have an inalienable right by basic constitutional freedoms of speech and assembly to do so at any distance. Also, if social distancing guidelines were strictly enforced, that would make it a potential misdemeanor for anyone not living with or directly related to individuals like me to offer them any physical assistance at any time during the next month. That is not only impractical, it is highly discriminatory. Three, my final concern is that Branson must lift its restrictions on so-called non-essential businesses before May 15th. Most of Branson's main attractions will not be opening until June at the earliest. So we're not worried about being immediately overrun by crowds, but the current restrictions are prohibiting many businesses and shows from beginning necessary planning, training, and rehearsal as they respond to this situation. How and when to wear a mask, to distance, and to reopen requires an individual approach. Branson is historically a strong community of individuals who care for each other, and many of Branson's visitors genuinely love her and want to help her safely recover from the last couple months. Thank you very much. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Seifert with the Branson Lakes Area Chamber of Commerce and CVB. I guess what she said. <laughs> <laughs> very well, very well done. A couple of points. Uh, you know, I want to thank some folks here first and then get to our recommendation. Um, I want to thank, uh, frankly, the business community who really took a leadership role uh, before we had to take uh, any, uh, any ordinance or adopt any ordinance to mandate uh, kind of a shutdown. A lot of our business community, uh, which they know their customers, they know their employees best, and they know how to protect their employees and customers best. And many, many, many of them, if not almost all of them, took immediate action before uh, we as a community, uh, as a, a legal body, had to, to, to mandate a closure for the safety of guests and employees. So I want to say thank you. They made a very hard decision at that time. Uh, I want to thank the groups of folks that have been meeting in our community, whether they're official, unofficial, or whatever. Uh, it's the, uh, the folk, Lisa Marshall with the Taney County Health Department, uh, her emergency services group that she's been leading, uh, that the city staff has been a part of, developing guidelines and, and what that might look like, uh, the, the chamber task force that's been meeting, other groups that have been meeting to discuss how we protect our visitors uh, and our employees best, and what types of best practices can we implement into the business community uh, that's going to take some time, but uh, some are further along than others. Uh, some are expecting us to open this week, some are not planning to open uh, for a number of weeks, and that's the business's choice, obviously. Uh, and, and that really leads me to uh, this, is that uh, based on the, uh, the Chamber Task Force discussion Thursday and then the subsequent, I'm not for sure how many phone calls <laughs> afterward, uh, of, of just general feedback and concern, uh, you know, we would recommend that you take option number two. Uh, I think Mr. Lebeck, that was the repeal of the ordinance and basically mirror the governor's language. And I'll tell you, that's a, that's a pretty big change from where, frankly, we were maybe two weeks ago. I probably wouldn't have said that two weeks ago based on the feedback we were getting. Uh, that's, I, I know that's because I know what we were saying. Uh, but at this point, we think recommending to the business community 
uh, that they advise their, every employee uh, and guest uh, to wear face coverings of some kind. Uh, and I know that many businesses, whether we mandate it or don't mandate it, they're going to do it. They're going to figure out how to do it uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, a lot of folks uh, have taken issue with the, the signage, uh, and I think that comes from the creative nature of us wanting to be welcoming and, and less, um, you know, <coughs> we're the government, we're here to tell you what to do. Uh, it's about a great experience in Branson. It's about welcoming our guests, not throwing our guests into jail or getting into an altercation uh, over something like this. Uh, I've heard from a number of businesses, again, that are prepared to open this week under these types of guidelines, the governor's guidelines specifically, uh, and they're taking extra precautions beyond those guidelines. So at this time, what I would say is uh, we would encourage you to move forward on option number two. Yes, option number two. Uh, and let's get those businesses who have the ability to protect their guest employees starting tomorrow open uh, with all of the, the understandings uh, under the governor's guidelines. And like I said, a number of folks are going to take, and other businesses are going to take extra time to figure out when they want to open and when they want to begin to engage the public based on their business model. But it's the business community that will lead the way out of this just as they led the way into this. And I want to say thank you to all of the folks who have put a lot of work into the documentation. And it's, I think it's easy to criticize and, and, and think, boy, this is restrictive or, or the, the ordinance in front of you. But I will tell you, this issue has moved so quick and every day something new develops. Uh, and so as we look back, uh, that made a lot of sense to me, but today, and based on the feedback we received from the ta uh, Chamber Task Force meeting Thursday, uh, option number two makes the most sense today. Thank you. My name is uh, Chris Meyer, uh, 269 State Highway, State Highway 248. Um, I just want to concur. I think after seeing the three options, I would agree with uh, Mr. Seifert that option two is makes the most sense. And it makes the most sense just because when you guys pass a different ordinance and why we had even this emergency meeting today, things are changing. And uh, if we're in alignment with the state, I think that's easier to communicate than two different policies. Um, and so at some point, we also have to trust our state leaders. Uh, it sounds like there is some cases ambiguity, and sometimes there's ambiguity just for that very reason. Um, and so that would be my encouragement. But if you guys are going to pass this existing ordinance, I think there's some problems with it. Um, and I will just highlight a few of those that I see. Um, one of the things in there, it talks under definitions, it talks about enclosed public spaces and it has amusement parks and attractions. Does that include mini golf? Does that include go-karts? Does that include those type of things that are outdoors? Obviously, those are not enclosed. And so I think this language in here presents some ambiguity. Um, under the personal, uh, the, the section that deals with uh, section 58387 that talks about if you're seated and eating and drinking or smoking, you don't have to have the face mask. But if I'm just seated, I have to have the face mask. That doesn't make much sense there just from, to me, a logical standpoint. Um, some of this about the enclosed areas doesn't make sense where if you have a bigger area, you, you have 10%. If you're a smaller area, you can have 25%. But I understand that's part of the state law, so you might not be able to do anything with that. Um, but that also doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I don't think we really need signage. Um, do you think that by us having that sign, someone's gonna learn something they already don't know? If they, if they don't know it, they've been in a cave living for the last two months. And so that's an undue expense. It'd be great for the sign industry. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're already busy with plexiglass and signage already, but it's not, at the end of the day, these items are not necessary. Um, I think at some point, uh, and, and, and what I've tried to tell people is, and, and I think the lady mentioned it earlier, um, how this was all to kind of reduce the curve initially, but this virus is not going away. And it's not going away anytime soon, at least, let's put it that way. And so as citizens, we have to, we have to become responsible for ourselves. You cannot be responsible for all of us. 
And so we have to be able to make intelligent decisions uh, individually and as businesses. Um, and we have to have the freedom to do that. Um, and, and those people that are high risk, they have to say, man, maybe I need to stay at home. But other people that aren't high risk uh, shouldn't. You know, and I, I looked today and I said, okay, if there's 50,000 people in Taney County, we've had 12 cases according to the Missouri website, that's 0.00024%. That's, that's a pretty small number. Um, that doesn't mean it's not bad, but we're, we're not doing this for other stuff either. So I, I think we've got to figure out that, um, that risk factor. And I, think, I don't think you can figure that out for everybody yourselves. I don't think that's what we elected you guys to do was to figure out what the risk factor should be for all of us. Um, I, I looked at this from a tourism perspective too, and, and if we open tomorrow, I can tell you a lot of people still aren't gonna open. It's gonna take a while for people to travel. Uh, so even if we open, we're still gonna be suffering as the tourism industry for quite some time. And I don't think people have even put numbers to this. And, and of course that has a trickle down effect in the economy. Um, but I looked, at, I looked at just March, April, and May for hotels, theaters, attractions, and restaurants. So that was just four categories. That wasn't all the other ones. And, if, and, I, and I just tried to do some estimates, okay, based on what I know in the industry. And even in, in just those four categories, and I hope I'm wrong, okay, let's put it this way, but I estimated we're probably at about a $79 million decrease in revenues. Okay, now some people would probably say, well, Chris, you're just, all you care about is money. No, I don't care just about money, but it is a fact of life that people do need to fund their mortgages, they do need to stay in business. We've already heard about people that are going out of business. And so at the end of the day, this still comes back to individual responsibility. And so I think you guys got a great opportunity. I think you have a great challenge ahead of you. Thanks for being our leaders and working on this. And it looks like my time's up and I'll trust that you guys will make the right decision. Thank you. Hello, my name is Clark McBratney. I'm a lifetime resident of Branson, Missouri. I'm a veteran. Uh, I believe in freedom first, even to a certain degree above our safety. A lot of lives have been given with that concept in mind. When I hear, uh, you know, laws that were written in 1909 being quoted in Gallup, New Mexico, which has nothing to do with us, and it's probably a huge violation of their rights there. I just want to encourage you to narrow the margins of your power, not to try to broaden the margins of your power and give grown people the right to operate their businesses, their personal, their personal space. We, we, we reacted to this thing ori originally Quite frankly, in my opinion, we overreacted. And uh, we have 12 cases in Taney County. So my, my main point is to say, remember that you, even if you have the power from some archaic law, that this is all gonna come back around someday. There's probably gonna be legal action. There's gonna be a lot of things that happen as a result of this. But you should consider narrowing your power, not trying to broaden it. That's all I have. Thank you all. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Mark Pierman. I'm, I'm the owner of Branson Craft Mall and Pick and Porch Grill. And uh, I'm just gonna reiterate what some of the others have said. I encourage you to vote for option two. I think option two is in, in uh, uh, the guidelines from the state are, are uh, what we need to follow and adhere to here. Also, there's a couple other questions I had. One thing that you said, uh, this ordinance would affect uh, up to five miles from the city limits. Is that correct? Didn't you say that? Mayor, can I go yeah, to respond? Go no. All I'm saying is that under Chapter 79, Section 380, state law, the quote-unquote archaic law that that gentleman referred to, 
this board has the authority, if they so choose, to set an ordinance out five miles outside of city limits. Okay. Okay. Not that, that not that this ordinance does that, okay. but they okay. can. Well, I just I misheard that. The other question I had also is we did um, a lot of testing last week, COVID testing. Does anybody have the results of that? I haven't heard the results of that. What you do have the results? What what are the results? They tested like 400 people last week. Is that correct? If Lisa's is online, or is that am I correct in saying that? Is Lisa on the line? Lisa heads up the health department. And okay, great. I, I was just kind of wanting to see what the results would be from the testing that we had had done last week here in Taney County. Sure. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. And that's all, I, that's all I had. Thank you all very much. So could we, we identify, Lisa, would you identify yourself for those listening, please? Sure. My name Thank is Lisa Marshall. I'm the director of the Taney County Health Department. And we tested, uh, it was a partnership with the Department of Health and Senior Services and our mobile testing unit partners, which include Cox Branson, City of Branson, Mercy, Jordan Valley, uh, and Taney County Health Department. So we were able to test 340 individuals from uh, largely Taney County. We had some Stone County residents and also some Christian County residents as well. Um, of those uh, tests, we have not had any come back positive at this moment in time. And we are uh, actually right now at editing a press release to go out today. Lisa, would you share the parameters of those tests for us so that they're a little different than the tests that are being done in other locations? So these were uh, just a, a regular COVID-19 test. They basically tested whether somebody had COVID-19 that, at that point in time. They were not an antibody or a serology test, but just to strictly see uh, who has COVID-19 right now. And so um, I just want to point out that we are considering this to be a public health win. Uh, so when public health does its job is when you don't see bad things happen. Um, so our numbers around having 12 um, is because our community has been very aggressive and very proactive in taking precautionary measures. So we are considering this to be a public health win. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name's Tom Roten. My wife Susie and I own the Branson Cafe. We've been lifelong residents in Branson. We've been involved in the food service business in Branson, uh, my family going back to the 1960s, and then Susie and I since 1983. We are acutely aware of all of the current health restrictions, health guidelines that we have to observe with regard to training and certification for our employees and owners for people that come into our business and work. Anecdotally, I can tell you that my experience out in the public is not everybody observes the same level of hygiene that we do because I've seen gloves misused. The mask issue is a real issue. Um, I would reiterate what several of these people have said. It seems like we're all pretty much on the same side here. I would encourage you I'm not sure how to phrase some of this because my emotions run pretty high by nature. But as the man just said, I think we have overreacted in this particular situation. And I suppose you could argue if we had not done what we have done, would the consequences have been much more uh, dire or uh, severe? All speculation. At this point, it would seem that the level of infection and the real danger is over. We need to exercise caution and good hygiene and civility, but let's remove the limitations on business, all of them. Let us go back to working, providing for our employees who want to provide for their families, for the truck drivers and the pop company and the grocery salesmen. The cure cannot be worse than the disease, and I'm afraid that that's what this has become. 
if we don't start backing off some of this, I'll apologize for the word if it's offensive, but some of this draconian legislation in other locations, it has gone on and is going on still. I would just encourage you to uh, give the operators here in town credit for being reasonable and, and uh, conscientious and let us go back to work. Let us own our businesses like we own our businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. My name's Jonathan Edwards. I have the show Absolutely Country and Definitely Gospel here in town. And just a couple of quick things. One of the things I really, really hate about politicians, and don't take this too offensive, but in this document you talked about, you talked about us as theaters and all the operators having to do certain things. However, I've sat here and I've been the eighth speaker at this podium right here, and it hasn't been disinfected once. However, if you came to my theater, you would expect me to do that, correct? Consistency. Second thing is, we talked about flattening the curve. The purpose for doing something, when you have a purpose and you fulfill that purpose, that means it's done, correct? If you purpose to build a building and the building is completed, do you continue on with that or do you stop? We find ourselves in a situation where I can ask this question to all of you, when does this stop? And there's not one of you here that can answer that question. In fact, I've asked. Mr. Mayor, you were nice enough to respond to my email about testing. What does testing prove? Well, as we heard today, testing proved that there were zero cases today. However, you test those same people in six days, what's the response going to be? So why are we doing what we do? Why are we shutting down Branson? As Ben well stated, the fact is, is that it's going to be a while for us to come back because of the nature of most of our businesses in this town. So the sooner we get it rolling, the better off we will be. Otherwise, you can kiss 2020 goodbye. Another question I'd just like to ask is, when does the personal responsibility start? Well, it starts when we wake up every morning. We have people that don't take responsibility. But should that be affected on those of us that do? I definitely don't want people coming to my theater and getting sick because the worst publication I can have is somebody getting sick at my theater. So do you not think as a theater owner, I would be one who would go above and beyond to make sure that my guests are taken care of. See, the problem is, is that in many cases, we rely on you as government people and governments in general to take the responsibility of the individual. The truth is, most of you don't know me, have never met me. You really don't care what my business does, but I do. And your business is the same way. So I encourage you, and I, nothing against the, the, the second step there, but the problem with going with what the state says is that the state is a big state, which Kansas City and St. Louis have proven to us to be totally different than Branson, Missouri. So my only caution with going to what the state does is, first of all, what happens if there's another outbreak in Kansas City? Do we shut Branson down again? I don't know. If you go with their guidelines, they're going to do it. We hear one size does not fit all. One size doesn't fit all in the state of Missouri either, as we well know. So I just want to encourage you to take a look at that also find out why we're doing what we're doing. And if we have passed the date, if it is over, will it come back? Maybe. I, I'm, I'm for one to believe COVID will be around as long as the flu's around from now on. Because we won't have a vaccine, most likely. We don't have vaccines for viruses in most cases, but we live our life. And as I ask you, Mayor, in the, in the statement is, we all that work in Branson know that come fall, we have a bunch of people get on a bus and come to our town. Elderly folks. And one example, when I worked at Sight and Sound part-time, we called the ambulance out seven times in one week. Why? Because they had the flu. So the next time that happens, because we have the flu and an outbreak on those buses, that we shut the town down. Be consistent in whatever you do. And my encouragement is, take Branson totally separate from any other place and do what's right for us, not for the state or politicians. Mr. Mayor, can I make a comment yes. real quick, just so we're all on the same page? That DHSS order is statewide. We are required to follow it. The only thing this board can do 
is make rules more restrictive than that. We can't lessen those. So again, I'm not trying to second guess what you're saying, sir. I just understand that that's coming from above and we have to follow it, whether we want to or not. Thank you. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment. We appreciate the fact that people have taken time to communicate and I've tried uh, to answer as fairly and as openly as I can. Uh, sadly, I've, I've used uh, the Branson Cafe several times in examples. There's no way that they can get six foot spacing and be able to have enough people in their business to make it. A long time ago, I said, none of this is going to be convenient. It's gotten way beyond being convenient. It's gotten to be a real, real issue for old-time friends and old-time businesses and people who are here. We're trying through the chamber, working with them, and through a group of people. Larry serves on a committee. Bill serves on a committee. I think Kevin did. Uh, we're trying to get information together so that we can get a game plan. And the state has a next phase. After the 31st of this month, there's another phase. How can we get information to them to help Bransonize a new direction for us? And uh, <coughs> it is, um, it's a difficult and sad situation. But we're going to deal with it. There is, to me, this community is so amazing. We've got people figuring things out, and they're going to make a difference. And we'll get it up to where we need to to be able to make some changes. But that's what our job is, is to try to communicate what our community needs under this. So thank you. I'll shut up preaching for a while. Anyone else? Well, thank you all for your input. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. Now it's time for us to do something. And so at this point in time, do we have a motion on the floor and a second? Excuse me. Yes. Someone wants to come forward? Okay. Ma'am, we can't hear you. You need to come to the microphone, please. This is an example. Your name? Um, Doreen your... White, and I'm a 21-year veteran. I was a dietitian. You'll need to get closer to the mic, man. I'm sorry. I was a 21-year veteran. I'm a resident of Branson for five and a half years. I think you all did a good job. I think the people of Branson are safe to move on because they are in that mode, and they, what, 0.24%. And I'm a native New Yorker, and we can yell and scream all we want, but look at their city and what it's going through. And it could have happened here. And thank you, the police, the first responders and everything. Um, I'm at the, I worked in nursing homes, and I think that if they could get appointments to meet with their residents outside, or if somebody's on their deathbed, that, you know, do an exception for that, you know, unless there's a contact of COVD in the nursing home. Um, I just visited Fort Leavenworth and that guy that's retired military or whatever, they're going single file. They have masks. Every place you go in, you have to wear a mask. Um, I believe that following the rules now will give us legency, you know, we'll get more, be able to do more in the future instead of doing less. Um, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, let's see here. If I could see, take off the mask for a minute. Um, um, that's pretty much it. Um, that I want. I was listening to you guys on the radio. Um, I did that thing about the kid here. I think that was inappropriate for this meeting because it could have been addressed somewhere else. The civil liberties about the kids. Um, that's my opinion. And thank you for what you do. And I think if we do this now, we're going to have more in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. We're going to do our best. 
All right. Um, is Lisa Marshall still on the line? Hello, Lisa. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the line still. Hi, this is Larry Milton. Hi. Hi, thank you for sending out the notice this morning. And sure. if I understood that right, it sounded to me like the Taney County Health Department's recommendation for the city of Branson is to follow the governor's guidelines. Is that correct? Or would you expand on that, please? Sure. So what I would suggest um, is more of a phased approach like we've been discussing. Um, we've worked quite a bit with a, a local task force here that involved our emergency responders. Um, it's involved our health care partners. The chamber has set in, set in on that as well and several other partners. Um, and really, we've worked through what we would recommend for a phased approach to reopening. We do think that there are certainly some criteria that need to be met in order to move forward. Um, I think one of our biggest concerns is largely around um, that uh, occupancy load specific to retail sales. We feel like uh, that should really be expanded to beyond just retail sales because uh, ultimately this virus can be transmitted anywhere people are. And though we want the city to be open and we want business to resume, uh, we just would really rather a more stepped approach uh, to give us time to see how our community is going to respond to people coming to it. So our recommendation would be more to um, expand that beyond just retail sales um, would be probably our largest concern with what the governor has put out at this point in time. Um, okay, so for clarity, what you're saying is you're following, you're suggesting following the governor's, governor's guidelines, except mm -hmm. where the governor set, um, where he separates the 10% for over 25,000 square feet under mm -hmm. 25,000, or over 25,000, 10%. What you're suggesting is that guideline not only apply to retail, but apply to what? Theaters? Uh uh, really to all businesses um, all business. that are indoor, indoor businesses, yes, sir. And then we are also um, big proponents of the disinfection piece that has been um, placed in the ordinance that uh, Mr. Liebeck has presented as well. Um, the we feel like those are really key components um, in keeping, uh, the, keeping the social distancing uh, because ultimately, this really needs to be a layered approach. Um, we can't just do one of these things and, and expect to continue on a path of good numbers and good health for our community. Uh, so we really would prefer to see more of a layered approach um, around the, the great disinfection processes, uh, occupancy loads for a short period of time. Um, and then, of course, at the health department, we are recommending face masks. But we do believe the social distancing is a very key component to all of this. So the, okay, so that is a, a distinct difference between what the governor's guideline is for the square footage requirement and what Taney County Health's guideline is for the square footage restriction. Yes, sir. Lisa, I have a question, if I could. Um, sure. The, so just a question on that. I, it, I struggle with this with regard to the six-foot social distancing. I'm a simple guy. I kind of keep it simple. If six feet distancing is sort of that magic number that we're looking for, can you help mm -hmm. me understand, instead of kind of like what the state guidelines have done except for the retail, can you kind of walk me through if we're keeping six foot social distancing and six foot is sort of that magic number, why do we then have to look at this sort of, I would say, more comprehensive and confusing 25% um, of occupancy up to 10,000 square feet and then 10% beyond that? It seems to, number one, make it more difficult to manage. But also, I'm just struggling with as long as folks can stay six feet apart, can we not let business owners decide whether it makes sense for them to open up and that they can maintain that six-foot distance or they can't. And let me just add this, and I'll let you answer, but 
my small office is 1,500 square foot. If you go to the back and look at the occupancy from the fire department, it says 15. If you take 25% of that, it's three point something. So I can have three people in my office. It doesn't matter about my office. I'm using it as an example. Mm -hmm. But if you take the guidelines from DHSS and the frequently asked questions, it talks about the calculation of 1,500 square feet divided by 30 multiplied by 0.25, and that's 12.5. So it's confusing because now I could have 12 people in my office and not three people in my office, and my concern is I think a lot of times the, the, the occupancy load that the fire department says they came in when I opened uh, eight years ago and said, how many people are going to have in here? And I said, uh, probably not more than 15. Boom, it says 15. So I just, I'm at an effort to keep things simple, I go back to my original question, if you would, and just help me with if six feet is the magic distance, your opinion, why do we need to complicate it by the 10%, 25%, over 10, that kind of thing, if you can help me yeah. with that. Thank you. No, that's a great question. And so the 25% and the 10%, they come from that mandate. And so that's not something that we can change on a local level because it is, uh, we can only be more restrictive than that. Um, so that's really the Department of Health and Senior Service at the state level and the governor at the state level. Um, but they're so limiting it, right? They're limiting it to retail. They are, so. they are limiting it to retail. And so um, to your point of six feet is a magic number, when you start thinking about how people move about, if, if we were all just staying in one static spot, staying six feet apart, that would be perfect. That would be great. But the fact is that when we enter stores or we enter theaters or we enter wherever the place of business is, we're not just staying in one spot. So we're moving about, we're touching things, we're using facilities, using restrooms, um, touching doorknobs and handles. And so the more people move about, the more opportunities there are for transmission of the virus. And so that's where that occupancy piece comes into play as well, is that if we were all just standing in one spot and we're not moving anywhere else, then that would be appropriate. But because we're moving around, the more people you get in an indoor confined space, the more opportunity for transmission of the virus. Okay, thank you for your answer. I appreciate that. I'm trying to envision yes. what it would look like to have an indoor space where people don't move around, but, but yeah. I do appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and I think that's where just the, the layering of these interventions is so important. So if we limit the number of folks that we're letting inside businesses and we um, ask them to wear face masks or recommend they're wearing, wearing face masks and we disinfect at very frequent intervals, then we just decrease that risk of transmitting. And I think the one thing that for Branson specifically, we've got to keep in mind is that Taney County itself, our numbers are sitting in a good spot. We've not seen uh, spikes. We've not seen huge increases. Now, we're probably just kind of looking at how the course of this virus and pandemic is moving. We're probably going to see a case or two here and there, and that's not surprising. So to think we'll never have a case of this is unrealistic. But our concern is once we start bringing in folks from places outside of our community, then you just open the door to what are people bringing here unknowingly. And the struggle, too, is that we are seeing, you know, folks that are asymptomatic, so meaning they have no symptoms, they don't feel sick, they don't act sick, um, they have no idea they're sick, but they are. And so our concern is not only for our county, but what are people bringing here. And so that's where, as we layer these interventions, we're keeping our community safe. Lisa, Larry Milton again, thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, you touched on um, a real critical point. Regardless of what we choose to open today, we're going to be relying on Taney County to keep a benchmark of how are we doing. Mm -hmm. Would you share with everybody the triggers that Taney County Health is going to use to, that would cause us to pull back? Absolutely, and as somebody alluded to it earlier, is that our goal is to not overburden our healthcare system. Um, and the reason for that is if we overburden our healthcare system taking care of COVID-19 patients, then we are not capable of taking care of, you know, the, the heart attacks, the strokes, the accidents that we have, um, unfortunately, just on a daily basis here in our county. Um, so we do think it's very important that we have some uh, triggers or gate criteria um, so that if we start seeing spikes in cases, we can at least have a benchmark and know that we might need to pull back a little bit. So some of the things that we will be monitoring here is going to be uh, the percentage of those that test uh, positive. Um, we don't want to specifically look at just if we get more cases, we need to rein it in because that's not always the case. So we will be looking at percentages of those tested and how many come back positive. 
Uh, we will also be keeping an eye on what we're calling the Taney County footprint. And so that is just keeping an eye on where we know uh, other locations where individuals come to Taney County from. So we'll be keeping an eye on those areas to just kind of know what's going on as far as their case counts and how quickly those are increasing. We will also be watching the capacity of our ability to test everybody that needs a test, and then also the capacity to do contact tracing. So that means anytime somebody tests positive, we launch into what's called the disease investigation where we do contact tracing. So um, if someone tests positive, we find out where they've been, who they've been in contact with, um, and just make sure that we can alert folks that they may have been exposed and then ask, ask them to take appropriate measures. Um, another really important piece to this is going to be our hospital capacity. So do they have enough vents and ICU beds and, um, and a decent patient count so that if we do see a spike, they can manage this? So those are all pieces that we will be looking at as we move forward um, from the Taney County Health Department perspective because we feel like if, if those items get overrun, if we see you know, large percentages of people are testing positive, if we see we don't have the capacity to take care of our sick people that need hospitalization or we don't have the ability to do complete disease investigations for everybody that has a case, then those are problematic, and that means our public health and our healthcare systems are overrun. And at that point in time, we would want to maybe take a step back um, so that we could regain a better sense of control before moving forward again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Lisa? Yes, Dr. Klontz. Chris and, and Lisa, Brian Klontz here. Hey, just wanted to touch base on um, what are your thoughts, Chris, initially on, on DHSS guidance on, on theaters um, that, that has been provided? And, and Lisa, have you had the opportunity to take a look at that as well? And what are your thoughts on that? That's a good question, Brian, or Alder, Alderman. What I have seen, and let me just pull this up here, I reached out to both DHSS and I also reached out to the governor's office because, again, we have retail sales in this DHSS order. It is not defined. Normally, when we look at a law, especially a law as in this case or an order that carries potential criminal penalties, there should be some definitions. What does that mean for the layperson that's trying to abide by state law? Um, when I reached out to DHSS, they responded to me, um, and their were, email back to me, this was on Thursday, uh, April 30th, they said, quote unquote, and I'm going to quote specifically from the email, the phrase is not defined. We suggest using the common usage of retail to determine if an establishment is a retail space. For example, a grocery store, hardware store, etc., is a retail space, but a gym is not. Ultimately, this will be up to the LPHA, and I believe what they're trying to say is the local public health authority to determine as they are the enforcement agency for the order. So that's how DHSS responded to my request for information on Thursday. I sent a similar email to the governor's office. Ironically, a lot of the contact information was stripped from the website, so I had to go through an info email. And their response was, and I quote, we have added a few lines of clarification to our fact page in regards to businesses. They provided me a URL and I can show you the URL. If you have a specific situation that is still not clear, please let me know and I will flag it for our team. Our communications team inbox can fill quickly, so feel free to email me directly at stephanie.whitaker at governor.mo.gov. Okay, so that's the communications that came into the city. I learned um, through Alderman Skeins and through Commissioner Bob Nichols and the theater group that um, I guess Billboard Magazine of all places, they reached out and they got a different response. And I'm actually gonna go pull this up so you all can see it. Um, we managed to track it down. Okay, let me pull this over here. And this response came down on May 2nd. Okay, and this is direct from Billboard's website. Okay, again, I don't actually have the physical response. I'd love to see it, but this is the article. Okay, and it basically says that, according to the Show Me Strong Guidelines, large events and gatherings are no longer banned. Um, seating shall be spaced out according to social distancing requirements. So they basically end round the occupancy load question and say social distancing. So again, it goes back to my observation about how fluid this has been 
going at the state level as far as these rules. So again, that's why you see what's before you not defined in terms of retail space, because we don't know how that's defined. DHS acknowledges that, but instead defined in context of enclosed public space. So that's from city standpoint. Now I'll turn it over to Ms. Marshall and she can fill in the gaps for me. Trent, unfortunately I have not seen the guidance on theater as of yet. Um, but I would say I, that's one of those pieces where I think looking at occupancy and spacing of seating is incredibly important, as well as that disinfection component around um, highly utilized spaces. Mayor, I have a question. Yes, Kip. Uh, question for uh, City, Lieba, uh, City Attorney Lieback. The question is um, if, and we've talked about different options and things like that, but my question is if we, um, if we sort of model, as, as maybe I suggested early on, but if we, if we model with the res, if we um, kill the ordinance and model a resolution based on the state, as the state changes, because it's not unheard of, right, to have, it's, it's a living document, it's gonna continue to evolve and change, I'm sure it has been. Would we then, if we have a, if, if we have a resolution tied to DHSS, would it then just, our resolution would change with DHSS because it would be tied to it, is that fair to say? depends on how it's worded. What I will tell you is we are potentially putting landmines into this. The better course of action if you want to kill this altogether would be just to let the state take over instead of trying to resolve what they're trying to interpret and do, okay? If that's the path you want to go. That's my legal advice to you because we're going to end ourselves up in a problem when we're giving recommendations that may be slightly different than what the state's mandating. Again, the order's clear. Who's responsible for this? Who's the enforcement wing? Local health department. So if we want to go down that path, let them drive. But again, if we want to go down a different path, do we want to put more restrictive guidelines in place specific to our local community? So okay, I appreciate the answer because I, I, I think the up to $500 <coughs> fine and, and 90 days in jail is kind of a landmine to me. <laughs> so I, I agree that uh, I would love to see that, but uh, and, ju and just so we're clear again, that state order that's an A misdemeanor if you violate it, period. Okay, that's a, up to a year in jail, up to a $2,000 fine, and you know where enforcement for that goes? That goes over to the county. It comes outside of the city of Branson. So you're saying a resolution mirroring the DHSS would include jail no, time and fines? No. Okay. The, well, resolu the resolution has no effect on the actual DHS or S order that already includes a penalty of an A misdemeanor if you violate it by the state law that's currently in place. So if we have an ordinance and we take out and we take out the uh, criminal component, meaning jail and fines and things like that, what does that look like? Resolu Lisa just pointed out and she said, said it very succinctly and I'm going to try to say it again. A resolution has no authority. So regardless of what this resolution looks like or does, if somebody goes out and violates that DHSS order, guess what? Sergeant Kaufman standing behind you, if he observes it, he could probably write a probable cause statement if he finds PC that a crime's been committed under that order, and he can ship that whole mess over to the county prosecutor as an A misdemeanor. That's regardless of what we do today, if we go down that path. That's the point. So I know people are concerned about 90 days in jail, $500 fine, or general penalty provision. It doesn't matter, is what I'm trying to say, because though this is already has the potential to be a state crime if somebody violates that DHSS order. Okay, but real world, city of Branson, let me rephrase it, one alderman in the city of Branson has no interest of criminalizing this. So technically, what you're saying is, if the city says, we don't want to criminalize it, what you're saying is Taney County Sheriff can come to Branson and enforce it. No, what I'm saying is Branson Police Department, because the state has mandated this is a crime if you violate it, and they get a, let's say, let's say I'm sitting here right now, and I see that, oh gosh, I'm, I'm concerned because, let's go to the order, let's just, let's just give you a hypothetical, and maybe this will help explain it better, okay? If I look at this order, okay? And I see down here that, let's pick on restaurants for a minute. I'm sorry, Branson Cafe. But let's pick on restaurants, okay? Restaurants may offer dine-in services, provided that the limitations on social distancing and other precautionary public health measures 
including proper spacing of at least six feet between tables, lack of communal seating, and having no more than 10 people at a single table are properly adhered to. Let's say somebody calls Branson PD and says, hey, Branson Cafe's got 40 people sitting in their cafe all at one table. Sergeant Kaufman takes the call. He goes out there. He does an investigation. In his police training, he realizes, hey, there is a violation of this order. He has the ability to send a criminal charge over to the county for review for filing, regardless of what this board does, because this order is currently in place as of 1201 last night. Okay, so technically, I don't want to split hairs, he has the authority to do that. But knowing that the community does not want to do that, would Sergeant Kaufman still do that? I mean, I know he could, technically, legally. I don't follow what you're trying to, the point you're trying to make, Alderman, and I apologize. Maybe I'm a little dense because I need a bathroom break right now, but can you please? Let's take a bathroom break. Oh, I'm sorry. You did a bathroom break. Consensus, take a five minute break. It is now quarter till two, so we'll be back here at 10 till two.
out a way to keep distancing. Uh, but there's some creative folks that have come up with some stuff. So we're ready to reassemble. We're waiting on one alderman. He Mrs. should be Milton, back. have you seen your husband? Appreciate you all trying to keep the distance like you should. Appreciate those who are trying to protect others if they know they've got a little bug or something by wearing a mask. We're going to buy him a new watch. <laughs> Lisa, do I need to call, have Ro called again? No. Do I need to have roll call? Not again? now that you have your alder. We could just announce we have all alder aldermen back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> We're supposed to give you a standing ovation. Oh. <laughs> well. <laughs> Not much Chris, we were uh, nope. in discussion in regard to the state, and we talked about. Is there any other information that we've received in regard to any kind of allowances that the governor might make on assembly for other types of business, including theater? All I can say is this, is we are in uncharted territory right now. Texas is dealing with the same thing. Remember, the governor is the head of the executive branch. The director of DHSS is a political appointee of the governor confirmed by the Senate, okay? So the issue becomes this. We have an order that says specific things, okay? And then we have a governor's office that's putting out an FAQ and putting out, trying to help and put out guidance, okay? The problem becomes this from a legal standpoint. I'm gonna really kind of paraphrase this, is his guidance is not precedent. The only way to get a true interpretation of let me pull it up here, of this order, is if somebody were to violate it, that person were prosecuted or somebody would litigate it and say, hey, I need a court to tell me what this means, okay? Now they can use the governor's position, the governor's language, his FAQ, his show me strong recovery plan as an aid to help convince a court that that's what this term or that term should mean. But from a legal standpoint, and again, I'm not giving legal advice to any business in this city. I can't. But from a legal standpoint, quite frankly, all that matters is what's in that order. So again, that's where we're running into some challenges right now. So is there any, obviously we talked about this is phase one and mm -hmm. we're looking. Is there any way that we can get an interpretation what else a business might do in lieu of the six-foot spacing? Short of another order coming down from DHSS or an amendment. That's, that's what we're dealing with right now. So again, we have this. Everybody's got to follow this as of 1201 last night, okay? And they have to make their best guesses to what this means. From a city standpoint, we have to decide today whether we want to add to this or we have three choices. Continue as is, essential, non-essential, have our recurrent restrictions remain in place. Option two, repeal the whole mess and just lean on this. Or option three, realize that, you know what, as Ms. Marshall said on the phone, there's a layered approach here, so there's some additional things we may consider from a health perspective to make sure that this continues on and try to come up with a framework where that doesn't place crazy restrictions on businesses, allows them to function, and again, doesn't compromise what DHSS has mandated. So that's, that's where you all are at and what you have to decide. And I, I can't tell you which direction to go, that's your decision. But the Thank bottom you. line is, this is in play right now, this is in effect, we need to decide, do we want to supplant this in any way? So 
Chris, wouldn't a solution be we follow the governor's guidelines as our own resolution, so if the state makes changes later, we still have our own. If he opens up more than we feel comfortable, we still have our own resolution. You're shaking your head no, Lisa, we can't. No, no. No, I have no I'm sorry. Oh. A resolution has no authority. I'm sorry. Um, ordinance. There's no reason to do an ordinance. Again, if we do an ordinance, we're going to have to. If we, excuse me a second. If we don't do an ordinance and we just tie it to what the governor said. If we, okay, we have option A is this. Okay, and we're going to go to what uh, Mr. Seifert talked about, picking choice two. How would choice two look? Choice two would look as follows. One of you all, let me pull this up here so we can see it. You're going to have to make a motion. If I can get the mouse to work. Yeah. And I apologize if my audio keeps cutting in and out. Apparently it's happening on the live stream. So I'm gonna to try to be real close to the mic here. Or is the mouse? Okay, here we go. So here's the ordinance, okay? If we want to accomplish option two, which is let's let the state drive, put them in the driver's seat directly. We think, you know what? This layered approach that our health department's saying is a good idea, doesn't matter, we're just gonna let the state drive. Then what we would do is we would go ahead and motion in to repeal these three definitions. We would motion in to repeal Article 3 of Chapter 58, and then the, purpose, the bill, the amendments to the bill would cause this all to disappear. So then what would happen, the end result is you guys just passed a bill voted on a bill, then voted it into an ordinance that has the effect of removing Article 358 and removing all of these restrictions, and then state takes over, and we go down that path. Okay, let me try asking this again. But, it's, but again, it's not the, Stan's making a DHS. point. It's not the governor's order, it's DHSS that has made that order. Okay, let me try this again. If we went with option two and DHSS makes a change, would we be bound by that change if we just... Yes. So that's my point. So my point is, why don't we just come up with a ordinance that says what the governor is saying today, so if next week he says everybody's open 100%, we're not bound by that. We still have some limitations in place. Instead of just saying to... I guess I, I don't follow... I don't, want, I don't feel restate? comfortable letting the state drive and say, we're just going to follow whatever the governor says. Okay. Then what should we have in our ordinance? What rules? Again, not... Exactly word for word what's in the governor's orders today. So you want to basically copy and paste DHSS order into an ordinance. Take this and copy and paste it. Is that what you're saying, Alderman? This whole thing. Well, yes. Because, because here's, with the, here's with the, the caveat being, retail means retail. Retail means if you have a retail license. Retail doesn't mean attractions, theaters, skating rinks. There's two potential issues. Number one, some of the things in this in this order, the city doesn't have jurisdiction over. Okay, I think there's some confusion as to what role we have with regards to education. Okay, we have no involvement in the education system. Okay, as a city. Okay, so item five, we can't copy and paste that in there because that's that's a different organization. Okay, so we'll okay. eliminate five. Okay. The other issue is a lot of this stuff is the direct result of their jurisdiction, the health department under 192.020. Okay, so what we have the potential of doing, and this is, this is again, I'm giving you my legal opinion, okay? If we do a copy and paste job, whatever it is of this in some form or fashion, we have the potential to make this more confusing for the public. Okay, that's the risk. I'm trying to keep it less confusing. The governor has said blank. 
And so what the governor says is what we are agreeing to today. So if there's ambiguities in what the governor said. The governor has not said anything. But Dr. Williams with the Department of Health and Senior Services has made this order. So the governor hasn't come out with any rules or guidance for the state? The gov this is it. You see his name on the corner. Okay. okay. He is a cabinet member of his okay. executive branch. So he is acting on behalf of the governor. And here okay. is this. So we take out Article 5, I mean, Paragraph 5. What is the other obstacles? You've got number seven, state office buildings. You've got, this is already state law. This is, I don't know why this needs to be restated. There's things in here that quite frankly don't need to be. The, the situation is this, Alderman. This doesn't need to be restated. We're not benefiting anybody by just simply restating what's already out there. That's, that's the rub, okay? Now I understand the concern. If I, if I understand what you're trying to get at, is the concern is come Sunday, May 31st, 2020, this goes away, then we're in a bad position. What I would tell you is if that's the concern, then we organize a special meeting well before that if we have an idea that this is going to get lifted and we've got an issue, and then we come up with a new framework like we're trying to do right now. Okay. But to simply just do a copy and paste job, I would strongly discourage you. No, no municipality that I'm aware of has done that okay. at this point. So I'm making a motion, we go with number two. Second. All right, discussion time. Does any of the aldermen have discussion on no, that? We already have a motion on that. So <clears throat> we have a motion on the floor. So I would suggest you have a motion on the floor right now to pass this ordinance as we is. I would say you would want to amend that motion to strike everything, as Chris said. Um, you have to, the definition is listed in uh, bill number. 5808, the definition section of 58-1, the purpose section of 58-386, 58387, 58388, 58389, 5890. Um, strike all that, is that right? Yeah. So you would want a motion to amend, motion to amend to strike all those sections. Um, leave section uh, three makes your effective day and time this evening or at midnight. Now that's an amendment to the motion on the floor, right? Is that where you want to go? Clarity, right? clarity. If we, if there's already an, there's already a motion on to approve the current ordinance. If we voted that down, then could we take and? We're in a bad spot because the moment okay. you vote this bill down. Guess what? It's gone. It's gone, and what's currently in place, which is essential, non-essential, business remains right. closed, stays into effect. You, you, so you've got to amend in what you want to do before we start voting. Okay. The only thing you have is this bill on the floor right now. If you okay. lose that, you have no other action for this meeting. Thank you. for You all straighten me out all the time. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good idea. Uh, so... Just to clarify before we go on, I have a motion and actually a second on the floor to do option number two. And I don't want to go past that because by rights I have those motions. So before we go too far, do you want to clarify any of your motions and your seconds so we know where we stand? I kind of sense that you might. I would like to clarify my motion. Do we have to repeal the second first? You I'd like to clarify the motion. To what you said. <laughs> Bravo. Proper tag. And does the second agree with that? I do. All right. So you have a motion and a second with those. Thank you. That would be the amendment yeah. to the current motion on the floor. You Alderman Skeens. Real quick, Clerk, would you, uh, Lisa, would you like me to go ahead and redline what's in, up yeah. there and save uh, a just, copy? Yeah. Just strike it all. <laughs> just He's so just, we know exactly yeah. what we're doing. Thank you. Alderman Skeens, do you want to go ahead and talk Please, I just wanted to add in, I thank Larry and, uh, and Kevin for that, that motion changing this thing. Uh, 
there's an old statement it's called Occam's Razor. Sometimes the simplest explanation seems to be the best, and the way that we're going appears to be that way. I don't think any of us sitting up here, uh, I can't speak for everybody, wanted to criminalize wearing masks or force anybody to wear a mask. I said that on social media. I said that over the phone to probably several dozen individuals and in between this. I, I, I can't imagine uh, Clay having somebody come into his theater and somebody's not wearing a mask and somebody's out there ready to write them a ticket and send them down to the pokey. That's not the intent of this board by any means. Uh, but hey, that stuff gets out there. The issue I would like to have is the issue of the should maintain six foot or reasonable distancing because it's common sense. People bump into each other. It's going to happen. They're not going to always maintain six foot. I don't like the idea of calling theaters retail. I owned the Engler block for almost 30 years. I know what retail looks like. Theater's not a retail. Place Theater is not a retail. Melzol Theater is not retail. Uh, the Magical Mansion, that's not, that's not retail. They're theaters. We're looked at them. Our own tax code looks at these entities as hotels, motels, theaters, restaurants, attractions, campgrounds. They're all taxed differently uh, as such. And they have, they have their own little amount of money. I, I don't like the idea of clustering them in <coughs> retail. I read over some things last night that made a real impression to me. Mayor reads over some stuff as well. This is set up by the people, for the people, and of the people. It is not our intent to mandate people to do anything in order to hurt them. We want to see the theaters open. There's a mistake in this community. If we don't think that the theaters being open and Silver Dollar City being open does not have a dramatic positive effect on our community. And if we find some way through our actions to shut that down, you're cutting your nose off to spite your face. Clay, and I appreciate what you said. If I wear kind of two hats, and I've tried to look at this two different ways. Of being th 30 years of owning 24 shops and three restaurants and being an alderman. How do you protect the public? How do you protect Larry, Bob, Kevin? How do you protect everybody? At the same time, allow these people the freedoms that they need to have in order to move forward. I think that the action that we took earlier uh, has tamped this thing down. I significantly believe that had we not done that, that we'd have been worse off than we are now. I think we're past that. Uh, hopefully that we are. I don't think we're ever going to turn to New York or Los Angeles. I think this area here is, uh, is governed by common sense uh, and patriotism at the same time. And uh, moving forward with what Larry had suggested just seems to be the, the common sense way, Mr. Mayor, to move forward. We don't need to make this any more complex. Chris is going to lose every hair he's got left on top of his head. I don't have any hair. We do that. So I'm going to leave that except for just to go back and state that we need to bring common sense to this part of the process and not complicate it. We don't need to complicate Stan's life, John's life, or any of our other people's lives out here. I do would like to hear from the remainder of what the CVB is going to recommend on the 8th and see how that might impact us moving forward. And thank you for the time. At this point in time, Chris, would you want to go back through to make sure we know exactly what we're voting on? Right there. I'd be happy to walk through this. So um, real quick, Chapter 58, what Chapter 58 is, and let me show everybody. Um, give me one second here. I can make the mouse go where it needs to go. So our Branson Municipal Code, just for an example, it's online. Okay, Chapter 58, where we park this, is our offenses and nuisances. So this is where possession of marijuana, Possession of drug paraphernalia, driving while intoxicated, smoking, noise, yada, yada, is located. So what we did is when we passed this in March, on March 23rd of this year, we parked it in Chapter 58, okay? So we parked it in two ways. So the first thing we did is we added definitions under 58-1. 
So the first part of this motion, if I understand, if, as it's moved in, is we're going to remove all of those definitions, including the additions that were the subject of this bill. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to remove Article 3, Communicable Disease, specifically the purpose, why we're doing this, the restrictions on personal conduct, um, the previous version, and as a, we are to, we're attempting to amend today, closed public spaces, removed, 389, removed, 390, removed. So we're basically backing up all the work that was done on March 23rd and dropping it, okay? How do we know that? Okay, I'm just gonna use another visual is because when I look at the original ordinance, this is the ordinance that was adopted March 23rd, 2020, and hopefully I can make this go big. Let's see here, with my old eyes. Uh, is there a way to pop this out, Brandon? Help me out here. There we go. Yep. Maybe. Popped it up so much it left. <laughs> yeah, it worked. <laughs> That's a feature, by the way. Um, <laughs> Operator error. Oh yeah, click here, I got it. Click that. Yep. There we go, so we're gonna go ahead and pop this out. Maybe. There we go, let me just move that back over here. So this is the ordinance that was passed March 23rd. Okay, you will notice those definitions are getting gutted, 58-1. Purpose, mm -mm. social gatherings, non-essential, 389, which is eating and drinking, 90. So all the content that was there on March 23rd is getting dropped, unless Lisa sees something that I missed. Okay, let's go back up to definitions. That was already in there, so if I go. No, we don't. Okay, so again, what we're doing is we're basically gutting out our communicable disease ordinance that was passed March 23rd with this motion by Alderman Milton and seconded by Alderman McConnell. So Chris, can we just put up what the final will look like? We won't have. We won't? You'll just go back to what the state has. So oh. you there's nothing on, there will be nothing on our books anymore. Yes. Just, I just want to make sure and ask uh, <coughs> the alderman up here. By doing this, we're not going to restrict the theaters to that very narrow approach, 10%. Uh, that's that's putting those people into bankruptcy. If we do that, that just doesn't make any sense. And the same issue of the issue of of mask. I just like to have that. Yeah. I don't want to criminalize anybody, even Larry. To wear the mask. What I will suggest it sounds like election season. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I will suggest on the you theater issue is that the theaters call DHSS, call your health department, ask them for guidance, okay? We're out of that game if this goes through, okay? They're the ones that are going to tell you how this is enforced. Yes, Mr. Sanders. May I, Chris, may I ask? We've got other venues that are closed venues like, uh, like Bill's used to be. Uh, where you've got several different retail establishments, theaters, entertainment, all indoors. Uh, a couple come to mind are the IMAX and Glenn Robinson's out there. They're probably in that over 10,000 square feet game. But now under, under the governor's rules, how does that affect those places? And You're going to hate the answer, but it depends. Oh. <laughs> um, that's the horrible attorney answer that I hate attorneys giving, but it depends. Again, it, I don't know. I don't know how the state will interpret some of these mixed-use places. The best I can tell people to go after, again, not giving you legal advice, because I cannot, is look at the governor's FAQ, send him emails, send the state questions, talk to your health department, and ask, because there is the very real possibility that that mixed-use facility may be subject to 10% under that state rule. Okay, but again, this is the best we've got today. Okay. Well, we do know it's at least six feet, right? Yes. That doesn't go away, and I think that's the, at the end of the day, perfect. Thank you. Real quick, I have a 
Mr. Simmons. One, one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Is Lisa Marshall still with us? Lisa? Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Thank you. Yeah, this is Bob Simmons. Uh, one of the other things we had in this proposed uh, one that, that's actually on the floor uh, was the additional cleaning requirements and the disinfecting every hour, uh, that type of thing. How important do you think that is? I understand that the governor has really put in what he thinks is the minimum that he can go with uh, in all of his outlying areas. St. Louis and Kansas City have stepped up and kept their stay in place orders because they think they're different, they're dense, and they need to do that. So what things do we need to do because we're Branson, Missouri? Uh, we're not a, a farming community sitting away from other communities. And we're certainly going to have, sooner or later, a lot of people in here. And uh, so what do we need? And this cleaning seemed to be something that was reasonable and, uh, and would be required. I think it's also something that most operators are probably going to do to some extent or another. But does the health department have the right to cite those that do not do this? If they do not think they're doing adequate cleaning, can the health department handle this without the city give them you know, additional guidelines to go by? Uh, so I think that a bit of the struggle is that um, when you look at what we inspect, um, when it comes to things like theaters, we typically only inspect where food is served. So we would inspect uh, their concession stands, but we would not per se inspect um, theaters and, or the actual theater itself where people are seated per se. Um, so that's a little bit of a challenge is that we don't have jurisdiction to inspect um, like, for example, some of these retail places that do not serve food, we do not inspect those either. And so um, anywhere that is serving food, such as the uh, restaurants, we certainly will be checking um, on their cleanliness. However, this, uh, what was the, the shall around disinfecting on an hourly basis and using particular cleaning um, methods, that we, we will not have the ability to enforce um, because it's not here um, any longer, but we will certainly be looking at uh, just the general practices that are within the food codes and our other codes that require disinfection and cleaning. Um, they will not be as robust as what has been taken uh, from this, but they'll still be inspected. We do have a handful of business toolkits that I just want to make sure that everybody is aware of, um, and those are specific to the different industries. So we have about four or five on our website that walk people through, um, business owners through how to assess if the risk in your business for COVID-19, how to keep employees safe, how to keep visitors safe. Uh, and those are fluid documents that we are constantly adding to. So we do have those specific to industries. But in terms of this disinfection practice, uh, it's very important. And I can't speak to the importance of, of this layered approach enough because I think that disinfection, along with some of these other things, are really what is going to help us um, keep our numbers from spiking um, in the end. So you would recommend that in some form or another, we leave that in here as an addition to the governor's uh, statement. Mm -hmm. Lisa, this That would be our preference, yes. Yeah. This is Larry Milton. I think our businesses have shown us time and time again that they go above and beyond what they've been asked to do. They know mm -hmm. what the trade-offs are if we start slipping back with issues. And I don't think any amount of enforcement will be, uh, have any of the impact that our businesses are going to do normally and naturally to keep our city open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, will, we are going to continue to push our education on that disinfection practices and what are appropriate cleaners. Um, it's something that we will continue to push, especially in the absence of formal language around it. But um, we do believe that to be a very, very key piece of this, especially as we start bringing in folks from outside of our community. Um, so it's something that, that we will be pushing very heavily. Um, and I certainly would hope that our businesses continue that practice uh, this is a little bit different than what a normal cleaning routine would be just because we are looking at a virus that is highly contagious. Lisa, Kevin McConnell here. I have a quick question for you sure. as well. Well, um, is it fair to say, and just piggybacking on what Alderman Milton said, 
you know, we say the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior in our, in our business. Mm -hmm. My observation from the business community has not only been, hey, we're willing to do whatever it takes to help slow the spread of COVID-19, but also um, asking for direction, begging for direction in some cases. That's been my experience just on the board. Is that, does that mirror your experience or have you recognized or noticed a lot of businesses sort of saying, hey, we're not doing that, we're not interested in doing that. What, what is your thought just in terms of the overall willingness of our local businesses um, to, to take difficult steps sometimes to help try to um, eliminate or, or slow the spread of COVID-19? So I would say the majority of our businesses that we've been working with through this pandemic have been very proactive and we are greatly appreciative of that and cannot thank them enough for that. Um, so we uh, just hope that that continues. I know that we've had businesses that call and ask us to review their plans or asking lots of questions about uh, cleaners and sanitation and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, allergies, getting me. Um, so no. we've been um, fielding a lot of those, <laughs> a lot of those type questions. Um, and we, you know, we hope that that continues to be the trend, that we can continue to be a resource and that our business community reaches out. Um, I think that uh, as we move forward with this pandemic, my hope is that it does not become the mundane and uh, kind of our numbers are okay right now, so maybe we don't need to stay on top of this like we were. Uh, so we will continue to push from the education avenue the importance of, of all of these items and encouraging the public to wear face masks, uh, and, uh, you know, just encouraging all of these different sorts of precautionary measures. Mm -hmm. Alderman, we're at the position to, uh, to be able to uh, vote at this time. Are you comfortable with that? I'm sorry, the public session is... We, oh, okay, I was speech. just, sometimes you don't hear yeah. what's going on. I wanted to make sure you knew that someone was trying to ask a question. I'm Thank sorry. you, Mayor. Please vote. You got to do it again. Yeah. You're going to have to do it again. To vote again. Six, Alderman, oh, yes, passed. Okay, six to zero. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, would you provide the introduction for this item? Your Honor, um, so at this point, we uh, have passed the amendment. So we have a motion on the floor for the original bill number for the first reading. So, which is basically everything stricken. So we need to vote on the original motion that's on the floor for bill number 5808, please. And that's what I was trying to get at earlier, just a second. As amended, yes, okay. as stricken. Okay, all right, so we're going to vote again and, and for the bill as amended, which would include what we've recommended. Yes. Okay, do I have a, uh, a motion? We already have the motion on the floor. We have a motion and a second, and then we made an amendment to it, which struck everything. Now we're back to you. the original motion and All second right. that we probably did at quite a while ago. So. Okay. All right. Now, is this, is this in the second phase where we then can allow... Uh, now, this is the first reading, but you, I mean, um, of the bill as amended. Okay. Do we need to have public input at this time, or do is it in the no. second part? Okay. All right. Yes, okay. Alderman Klontz. Yeah, we have clarification on what we're voting on. So, so um, we had the original bill on the floor that was presented by Attorney Lebeck with the, the pr proposed changes. So that all has now been stricken by an amendment. So we're sitting with basically the amendment again to be passed as a, fine, as a first approval of the bill. There's been a motion and a second already. So yes. We're ready to vote if you feel comfortable. Yes. Alderman, please vote.
Yes, six, six present, passed. All right. Uh, so now what we would we probably want to do is to have a final reading. So in order to have a final reading so it can get passed, we need a motion to, to ask for a final reading. Okay. That Listen. would be on page two if you want to read that. Yeah. Um, it's an alderman wishing to make that motion. So move. Um, I'll just read it if you would, Bill. Okay. It says, um, I move to read bill number 5808 for its final reading due to the recent state of Missouri guidelines surrounding COVID-19. Do you want to make that motion? So move. Thank you. Second that. There's a second. At this point in time, is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak regarding this matter? Yes. So we, this is only on the motion to read it the second time. Wait just a second. Who is that masked man? Reading test. Okay. We're voting to have a second reading. It's in there. If I'm following the agenda, okay. Okay, we'll fix it on final reading. Let's just get on that, because we've already gone past an amendment. So um, we're right now asking for op a, a reading of a final reading. Right now, that's all we're asking is, can we go on to read this for the final reading? And I have a motion a second, so I need a vote. Does that make sense? I'm a little uh, confused. Of course, that's not uncommon. So, Your uh, Honor, we're on page two. Yeah, that's what I thought. And we've uh, had a motion for to go on to a final reading. Yeah, please. And then there was a second. And then there's underneath the mayor's comments. Yes. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak? And that's only for the discussion if you want to move it to a final reading yet. It's not on the final. That's all it is on that motion to move it on. So should I invite anyone that wants to speak? They can, you, but they would be discussing if they do not want it to be read for a final time. That's all we're discussing, yes or no. Do you want to read it for the final time or let it go for another time? Okay. okay. Yes, I do. Okay, Marshall Howden, 106 Rose O'Neill. So I wasn't going to speak until I started to hear some of the things that were actually going on here. Okay, so um, this is a question um, for Attorney LeBeck. And so essentially what I'm saying is I do not think this should be read for a second read right now. And my reasoning is because of this question. So uh, Attorney LeBeck, basically you said that we will have to wait for the DHSS guidelines on whether theaters can open up or not. So basically that's what you're saying, that right now, as of right now, it will be up to the state to keep our theaters closed possibly indefinitely until June 15th? Is that what you're saying? No. no. What, I may, what I am saying is the following. DHSS, as uh, Alderman Skeins and Commissioner Bob Nichols has pointed out to me, has already referred, has provided information to Billboard Magazine on May 2nd advising that theaters can open. Okay? Fair enough. They have made that interpretation. I cannot sit here and tell the Haygoods, I can't sit here and tell Clay Cooper that you can open up. They are going to have to make that determination on their own under their own legal guidance. But as far as the signaling that we are getting from the state of Missouri is that they can opening. But again, that's for them to decide, not for me as the city attorney for the city of Branson or for the board of aldermen to tell them they can open. This comes from a higher power. Fair enough. We had some confusion in the audience. I retract my statement. I'm for a second read. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now I have a question. With what we, with what we just approved, following the DHSS and the governor, aren't we approving that theaters can open, that they're not retail? All right, let me back up. Yeah. The decision this board can make today is whether to make rules that are more restrictive than what the state has passed. Right. 
you have chosen by this amendment not to do so. So we're letting the state drive that ship. So again, it's gonna be up to them how these rules are interpreted. It's gonna be up to the health department how these rules are enforced. Okay, but right now, we, for the information we have from the state, their interpretation is concerts and that are all allowed. That was their interpretation on May 2nd, 2020. But as I alluded to previously, on April 29th, it was a different interpretation. So again, it's gonna be up to how the state decides that it's not up to us. But then you but, also but, but they have signaled to us that they can be open. Yeah. Okay. And then you also suggested that if they come back with something else, we'll, we could have another meeting to amend that. You um, always have the ability. Okay. And then we, we called a special meeting today because we had a quorum today. You always have the ability to ask two board members for a special meeting. And then if we get a quorum, rock and roll, we can put something together, okay? Ready to vote? Please vote. Yes, six, six present, approved. I'm continuing on to page three, and it's uh, <coughs> asking for Madam Clerk to read the second reading. Your Honor, this is the final reading of Bill Number 5808, an ordinance amending Chapter 58 of the Branson Municipal Code pertaining to personal conduct in closed public spaces and the spread of communicable diseases. You've heard the final reading of bill number 5808. Do I have a motion approving this bill? So moved. Second. There's been a motion and a second. Now we need a moment because we have a little change before you don't go too fast. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can I have a moment to speak, Mayor? Yes. All right, what I would like to point out here again, we want to make sure that this is precise. The way this was originally drafted is this ordinance was going to basically self-repeal on May 31st at 11.59 p.m. Why? Because that is the date that the DHSS order is set to expire unless it's extended by Dr. Williams. So what we need to have happen so that this thing doesn't revert back to our essential, non-essential version is I would ask that somebody strike the highlighted piece, and I'll go ahead and put it in a different color as Ms. Westfall suggests, so that this thing goes into effect Tuesday at 12.01 a.m. Okay, and then strike through this piece right there. Okay, I so bottom line is it just kicks on at that date and time. I make the motion we strike line 169 and the highlighted sections in lines 176, 77, and 178. Second. And a motion? Second. Second? But didn't, wait. Is there clarity? Is there a question on that? You just did it. No, that's a question. Do you want to go from the headline? The, the, the other discussion, what Lisa and I are having right now is, so we struck that piece. Again, remember my seven things we went through from face coverings down to when does this become effective? Do we want this to become effective Tuesday at 301 or 1201, or do we want it to become effective at a different time and date? Can it be effective as of 3 p.m. today? Yeah, uh, so you um, fix your motion to, <laughs> to amend that to say this ordinance shall become full force and effective immediately and strike everything thereafter. All right, I'm making a motion on line 175, section 3, to read this ordinance shall be in full force and effect at 3 p.m. No, immediately, immediately upon oh. passage. Immediately. Uh, it says it, effective immediately after passage by the Board of Aldermen and approval by the mayor. What she said. Second. So we're, <laughs> agree we're in agreement in the motion in the second? Yes. All right. Clarity? All right. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak to this matter? I think we've worn them down. Mm -hmm. Any aldermen? Need to come to the podium, ma'am. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 
We have mandatory exercise here. So. <laughs> you don't need a hard hat working with us. I just want clarification because I can't see it in any of this, uh, these bills. Exactly you, what is the specific? Could you state your name before you go on? I'm oh, so sorry. Camille Lombardi Olive. What is the spec specification as per the mask requirement? Because I believe that is not a state requirement. That's all. It's We're, not a state requirement, it's We're recommended. Adopting state. Anyone else wish to speak? Hi, Kelly Slaybaugh. Um, I just am, I just have a question just because it occurred to me. Is it wise to leave it open-ended? Simply because a lot of businesses around here for a lot of these state restrictions, uh, is it, it, I didn't see, is there language up there that says this ends when the state ordinance ends, or should you guys set a date that it's going to end at this point? Or I, I just didn't see an end date, and I didn't see anything that indicated that it would end when the state ordinance ends. Mr. Mayor, can I answer that? Yes. Um, that's a good question, ma'am, and this is a little confusing. So I'm going to try to simplify this. Let me pull this up here. What this bill is doing is it's removing the restrictions we've currently imposed on the citizens of Branson. So essential, non-essential businesses, the occupant load, the social distancing, the gatherings of 10 or more people. Okay, this is removing all of that. We don't want to put an end date on that because if we do, then what happens is this is going, that those things we're stripping will go back into effect on that end date. So we're gonna set ourselves up for potential failure then. So the idea here is we wanna leave it open so that it's completely nuked off the books. And then if the state decides to make their own changes or do whatever, again, you'll have to look to the state for the, that guidance, okay? But that date is the 31st of this month? Yes, so, th so the DHSS order dated April 27, 2020, ends unless it's extended by the director of the DHSS May 31st at 11.59 p.m. Did I answer your question, ma'am? All right, any aldermen? Please vote. Yes, six, six present, passed. Do I have a motion to adjourn the board no, of wait, 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 wait. <laughs> we already did. Now we have an amended final reading. We need to vote on the final reading. We already have a motion and a second on the floor. And that was just with that time change as amended. So we have a motion to read it, uh, to approve the final reading as amended. Okay. Thank you. And we're ready for a vote unless there's more discussion. Is it clarity? Please vote. We need to vote again. Yes, six, six present, passed. Now, Mr. Mayor, yes. Just a comment. I, I do think that the Board of Aldermen owe the uh, city manager and assistant city manager and the staff for the great work that they've been doing carrying on while we've been uh, sequestered. I think that that's owed to them. They've taken a lot of heat, uh, some unjustly. And I just appreciate the work they've done. Our police, our fire, our everybody uh, 
has, has uh, stepped up for us. It cost you ribs. Yeah. Do I have a motion to adjourn the Board of Aldermen meeting? So, so moved. moved. Is there a second? Right. All for the vote. We vote orally or <laughs> Yahoo or push the push button. button. All right. Yes. Six. Meeting adjourned. Thank you for coming.